you see the hundred thousand dollar cars, you see a lot of diamonds, you see, you know, for men, for the sake of men, you see a lot of females and they think that this is, you know, this is a life. Because I just actually visited him in California not too long ago. They got all the same things I was exposed to in my lifestyle, Lamborghinis, jets, boats, and everything. So, you know. And then you get kidnapped in Brussels. Alhamdulillah. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Say, guess who took Shahada? Guess who took Shahada? Guess who took Shahada? This is actually your first, like, exclusive interview, sit-down interview. Absolutely. Here on the Dean yeah. Show with us. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. And this has been long overdue. You guys been asking. You guys been sending the emails, the requests. Where's our brother? Where's our brother Amir? Where's he at? Formerly known as Loon. Well, he's here finally with us here on the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How you doing, my brother? Alhamdulillah. 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 I mean, you know, words can't really express, you know, the gratitude that I feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose me to endure a trial that only contributed to growth. I remember the last time I was on this show, I was very, very new to Islam. And what Allah had instilled in my heart of understanding Tawheed and understanding my purpose of creation or my purpose of being created, I was able to speak a very profound statement that started on this very show is that we're paying for the disease, but the cure is free. Is free. And that just only spoke to my state at that time. Void of any other, you know, knowledge of Islam to a you know, certain extent. But that right there, and you gave me this platform, you know, may Allah reward you to mm -hmm. express what was in my heart at the time and what resonated as my state as a Muslim at that particular moment. So... I mean, we are, we've, we've had some some uh, sneak peeks of you here and there. You popped up, but this is actually your first like exclusive interview, sit down interview. Absolutely. Here on the Dean yeah. Show with us. This is this is from Allah because you know everything else was, you know, under the conditions of COVID. You know, a lot of these interviews were virtual. You know, like when I first accepted Islam, I fled with my religion. You know, saying out of fear of the environment that I had left behind and the people that I had left behind. Because what I had found was pure. What I found was the truth. So I removed myself from the environment that would contradict or combat with that truth and that purity. And I moved to Egypt where I had an opportunity to study, you know, in, in several miracles as far as the language and I had just signed up at Elazar Al University before I went and made Hajj. Alhamdulillah. And my return from Hajj, I remember coming home to Egypt, dropping off everything that I had purchased for my family and getting on the plane to go to Belgium to give a talk at the university. And I'm just getting back right now from Belgium, pretty much. Mm hmm let, let's make a timeline. I want I want to go back a little bit for those people who kind of bring them up to speed. You got some people who are going to be turned out to this uh, name Loon for the first time, yeah. to uh, Amir for the first time. Many are fans of the show. They know you. Uh, you've been with us, you know, uh, years ago. But I want to start off with just kind of bringing people up to speed about, and then just in a nutshell, just like we did kind of the last time. And people can go and watch that program that we did, but you you started off a uh, kid from Harlem, yep. New York. Yep, born and raised in Harlem, New York yeah. City. And usually a uh, kid from Harlem, what's he aspire to be? What's he want to be? Just kids in general growing up, they want to live the American dream. They want to do what? Achieve what? What's what's on the minds of the youth? I think that children all over the world, they are inspired by what they see. So growing up in Harlem, I was actually exposed to, you know, the local drug dealers, you know, guys that were influential in the streets. There wasn't really too many outlets that were, you know, attractive, so to say. They were present, but wasn't as attractive as either playing basketball or, you know, indulging in activities in the streets. So 
this was common for you know the youth in Harlem to be exposed to these things and later to either be affiliated or involved to an extent to where you can actually reap the consequences that come with either your affiliation or your involvement. So that's my origin. And then the only escape at the time was the music business. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? The music business offered me an escape of what I thought was an escape, which actually became a more intensified aspect of what I had already, you know, uh, endured mm-hmm. through the streets. And then fast for- forward, you hook up with... Uh uh, people such as Mace, uh, Tommy Boy, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. some of these, ba- bi- uh, P. Diddy, yeah. uh, Puff Daddy, then you hit it big. Yeah. Fast track to that. How does that all happen? Well, in pursuit of that escape, which was me pursuing a career in the music business, I started off as a ghostwriter, which is a person who writes music without actually being seen. So you're actually contributing to other people's careers. And it was kind of a backseat type of thing. Where I'm able to make money writing songs, collecting royalties and publishing from writing songs for people and not really pursuing to be in front of the camera. So that started in like 95. I was writing for Shaquille O'Neal. The basketball player. Basketball player. I got a deal at Tommy Boy Records in 96. Then from there, I did a group project called Harlem World with Mace. And after that, I signed as a solo artist to Arista Records. And then from Arista Records, I went to Bad Boy Records. And then my career, you know, took off. Is Shaquille O'Neal Muslim? And may Allah be with you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, I mean Allahu Alam. But when I speak to him, he gives me salams. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? I return the salams without, you know, investigating. Alhamdulillah, he gives salams. You know, it is yeah. a right of a Muslim to return the salams. Yeah. So. Because we hear, we hear that Sha- Shaquille O'Neal... I believe he is. You know, Muslim. Allah knows best. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I have spoken to him one time since I've been home, and he actually had contracted COVID. Yeah. And he told me he wasn't feeling well. And, you know, I just recently seen him pop up in an interview. So, you know, inshallah, I'm going to reach out to him, and maybe that would be a conversation we're having in depth, inshallah. And, and for those people that don't know, I mean, Muslim simply one who has submitted his or her will to the creator of the heavens and no, earth. No, Sahih. Yeah. So, you know, these are things that constitute a person to enter the fold of Islam by way of testifying that none has the right to be worshipped with Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. You know, and what follows is, you know, implementation of that understanding. So you went now from being a ghostwriter behind the scenes Mm -hmm. and now you get up on the mainstream, Mm -hmm. right? You hit the big, it's a big deal, Mm -hmm. right? That's like the main, like the top where you can make it, mainstream, mm-hmm. singing with the, you know, the, the, the Mongol, Mogul himself. Yeah. He did, how did that, how'd you break through into that? Well, I actually, it was ghostwriting for him. Mm-hmm. I, st- <coughs> I started off writing songs for him as well. That so, means they're, you're, they're, you're the original uh, person behind the scene who's making up the words that he's going to say. Right? Absolutely. So, you know, you have some artists that are writers but then you have some artists that are performers and the ones that perform may require you know songs from writers so that was how our relationship started and then it actually propelled into me having a solo career as an artist at bad boy records so you know it all basically was me evolving from one position to ultimately like you said get into the point uh, or the pinnacle of what is, you know, required of success in the music business is become, you know, an artist who does a couple hit records. So I was able to do a couple hit records. I was able to write numerous hit records and I solidified my position in that business as an artist and a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And then from there, that, that relationship with Puff Daddy and everything that went on for several years Mm -hmm. for, for a long time. Yeah, I mean, actually, there was a moment of separation, you know, for professional reasons, never personal, because I just actually visited him in California not too long ago, and it was, you know, it was a great reunion, because you can't overlook the fact that, you know, we've accomplished a lot of things together, but at the same time, only by laws decree, had I not been 
in that business or had I not been mm -hmm. successful or exposed to the lifestyle and everything that came with that business, I wouldn't be sitting on this couch yeah. right now. Now, in the la and then we, we met from there when all that happened, how many years later until we actually met? We actually met, I believe, in 2009 mm -hmm. because I had, I believe you... Um, interviewed me or freeway first or how's he doing freeway freeway's doing great actually i haven't spoken to him yet since i've been home but i spoke yeah. to him a few times when i was incarcerated and you know may allah you know preserve him and, um, and, and increase him in good he had a, 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 a actual health scare you know and i believe he had a successful you know what i'm saying uh treatment or surgery that you know by law's permission has you know restored his health and he's out you know, pretty much doing what he was doing, you know, prior to that. So, you know, the fact that he's still, alhamdulillah, he's Muslim. And, you know, we look to, you know, that which is apparent opposed to that which is not apparent. So, mm. you know, he's my brother in Islam. We made Umrah together, my first visit to Saudi. Yeah. With me and you did Hajj and Umrah, right? I did Hajj and Umrah. I did Umrah first. Yeah. <coughs> and then I made Hajj, alhamdulillah. And, you know, Allah invited me to his house twice. Mm -hmm. So, you know there's no way to describe the gratitude that comes with being able to establish that fifth pillar in Islam, which I believe every Muslim aspires to do. And I pray that every Muslim, inshallah, gets the opportunity to go to, you know what I'm saying, you know, Bayt Allah. Amen. Amen. So then we meet in 2009, and I remember we were talking about your story, and then in that, in some of those questions, you were talking about the, the different perception that you are getting from meeting Muslims, being around Muslims, the hospitality, and, and some of these things. Absolutely, the same hospitality you showed me just today. You come <laughs> in, you know, and I, it's funny because I tell a lot of, um, you know, um, brothers and even, you know, brothers that never really experienced, you know, the hospitality of the Muslims. And I have a friend of mine that actually, you know, I've known for 20 years, we worked together, and I invited him with me to go to a Yemeni brother's house. Yeah. And I told him before we left, I said, listen, don't don't eat no food. I'm telling you right now, if you go to this place, you better go with an appetite because the Muslims are going to try to put a whole lamb in your body. They're going to feed you over 300 dates. You're going to drink like <laughs> 14 gallons of tea and kahwa and so on and so forth. You know, and jokingly, it's, it's funny, but at the same time, it just shows you that the hospitality of the Muslims is something that's foreign to people. Because, you know, in certain areas of the world, to extend yourself like that means yeah. it has to be something that's 20 years in standing, like yeah. something I have to, you know, that comes from a lengthy relationship. Yeah. But that's something that the Muslims just do on first sight. So your perception before you entered into the fold of Islam, of Islam itself, mm -hmm. was it negative? No, it was never negative. It was just ignorant. I, did, I never knew. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I fought some of the Muslims in my community who didn't take the initiative to call some of us who they were aware of our struggle and our plight in the streets and not invite us or call us to Islam. So, you know, it was never hatred because in my community we all coexisted and we all, you know, you know, utilized the space that we were in. For example, like most of the corner stores, they were owned by some of the Yemeni brothers, even some Lebanese brothers and so on and so forth. Then the taxi services before Uber and Lyft, you know, you had the taxi service was dominated by Western Africans, you know what I'm saying, from Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, places like that. And then, you know, the pharmacies were particularly dominated by Pakistanis and Indian or Bengali people as well. So it's like this was the extent of diversity that I knew in my area in New York City, and basically, you know, there was never no call. It was just, okay, they got their thing, and we got our thing, you know what I'm saying? So, I guess, you know, become, becoming Muslim, and then that brotherhood being extended based upon that acceptance of Islam, it just showed me that there was a world I was missing, there was a brotherhood I was missing. There was a lot of things I was missing, you know. So, you know, anyone that's inclined to Islam will learn these things as well, inshallah. Yeah. Let's take a step back in history, and we're going to just quickly react. I want you to 
this is you and me doing that interview in 2009 mm -hmm. and some things now that you're gonna hear do you remember some of these things that you said Let, let's uh see your, your reaction after we listen to uh okay. some of these words of yours how's that for the most part i think that a lot of people you know mainly you know preferably the youth you know we all share kind of the same common desires and temptations and I think the music business kind of breathes these things and it gives people this a one that video, dimensional which perception video is this? I need a girl? of, yeah. you know, no, so mostly the perks two. in the business, two, so yeah. to say. And I think that, you know, the youth, by being so inspired all around the world, you know what I'm saying, being so inspired by this lifestyle, a lot of them who have been born into certain faiths, you know what I'm saying, like Islam and, and things of that nature, you know, they try to incorporate this lifestyle into something that's so beautiful, you know what I'm saying, Islam is just so beautiful and I've, been seeing over the years how you know this this business and this lifestyle has affected so many of the youth and myself you're talking about the lifestyle I think now that traveling you, the world that people admire they look up and living yeah. this consistent pattern of doing so many sinful things you know that come with the business you know we actually you know have the opportunity to make songs that might not be so vulgar might not be so you know you know negative mm -hmm. but the reality of it is there's a lifestyle that comes with it and that was the thing that really plagued my life because what you're propelled in based on the success, you know, is a lifestyle that just becomes so repetitive and so consistent and you find yourself being removed further and further away from a truth, further and further away from peace, further away from anything that was pure about you before you entered the business. So, like I said, you know, on the outside, everything looks good. You see the hundred thousand dollar cars. You see a lot of diamonds. You see, you know, for men, for the sake of men, you see a lot of females, and they think that this is, you know, this is a life. This is, this is, like, you know, paradise right here on earth. But the reality of it is, you know, I couldn't purchase peace. You know, I was probably able to buy a car, buy a house, buy a chain. Couldn't purchase peace. And the reality of it is, while we're sitting here, while I'm sitting here constantly paying for the disease, the cure was free. Paying for the disease. Paying for the disease. And the cure is free. And the cure is free. Right there. So we talked about, you talked about the beauty of Islam. Let's start from there. So what had you, was, what was so beautiful about Islam that finally had you accept it? The beauty to me was, you know, simply Allah's guidance because I wasn't looking for Islam. I had never had no one talk to me really about Islam. I was never invited to any talks, any conferences or anything. Just my travels, which I was trying to salvage my career when I left Bad Boy, was my goal. But my first stop where I first got inspired was when I went to Senegal. And I visit, you know, Gory Island, the first slave houses there. And I learned quickly from someone who understood the history of that place that this was something that was pinnacle in removing my previous attachment to black nationalism or, you know, just nationalism in general or you know, the things that we hold on to as African Americans to restore or protect our dignity, our pride, our sense of belonging, and so on and so forth, when it was explained to me that 60 million slaves had passed through there, but 6 million never left the soil because they fought and they died, meaning they fought and they died because they would not submit to no one other than Allah. So they died on the very soil than the ones who were weaker any man and those who were overpowered by those who oppressed them, they became victims of the transatlantic slave trade. So that experience alone stripped me of nationalism and it gave me a, a, a heightened sense of understanding from just that space. Then next I visited Kazakhstan, you know, which is Middle Eastern Asia, and that is when I experienced a different form of diversity as far as the Muslims, because like I mentioned, I only knew of three particular groups or, you know, nationalities or ethnicities that shared this common, you know, saying understanding of Islam. But I goes to Kazakhstan and I learned that this is even more widespread than I ever imagined. 
And then third, because I became Muslim in Abu Dhabi. So visiting the UAE at the time where, you know, you know, may Allah make us better. It's not a place that, you know, kind of like, you know, you know, oozes with Islam or, you know, things of that nature. But shows you that this is Allah's guidance. Because at first I was going, I was going to reject the, the invitation because of everything that I was taught in this country about the Muslims, the misconceptions, the propaganda, and so on and so forth. So I was a victim of understanding from one particular di uh, 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 dynamic that the Muslims were these excessive people. But then you go to this place, it's like it's the exact opposite. These people are living, you know what I'm saying? Allah has favored them with wealth. They got all the same things I was exposed to in my lifestyle, Lamborghinis, jets, boats, and everything. So, you know, this pretty much brought it home for me. So I believe that that was Allah guiding me without statement, without words, without interaction with other Muslims, no invitation, nothing. Just a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> When he said, "Man yahdi Allahu fala mudalala, wa min yulil fala hadiyala," so whomsoever Allah chooses to guide, none can lead them astray, and whomsoever Allah leads astray, none can guide. So, I remember the first time I heard khutbah to Hajjah, and I just knew, like, Subhanallah, this is the very thing that clarified my experience that this was guidance. Mm -hmm. So you know. So now you're wa you're watching yourself. In 2009, mm -hmm. and then the epic statement that you made, I'm paying for the disease while the cure is free. What, do you, what are you thinking now? Now, everything you went through, and are you... As are you profound as that statement was then, is the same now. Because I believe that from my experiences and my travels of talking to the youth around the world and seeing the commonality and the things that, you know, they're attracted to and what takes them away from the memories of Allah... And what makes them abandon the, the Islamic identity and so on and so forth. This is just another means of paying for the disease. But ultimately, whether you're a person that knows or don't know, the cure still remains free. So even for the Muslim who's born, who Allah favored to come from the loins and the wombs of believers, and to be exposed to things that detour them or, you know, take them away from the memories of Allah, you know, a sincere repentance becomes the cure and mm -hmm. it's free. But the more we continue to indulge in these things, we're only paying for the disease and that which puts us on a path of gradual destruction. Mm -hmm. And for the non-Muslim who's ignorant or unaware of this cure which is free then they too until Allah guidance reaches them or Allah changes the condition of their heart they remain upon a path where they're constantly invested in a disease that will only lead to their demise not only in this life and the next but the cure yeah. is still free so at the time when I said that that was just my pure sincere emotion of understanding my current state at that time but now as you grow and understand the religion more and you study more and you learn all of the things that conform with the knowledge and understanding of Tawheed, then you know that Allah has provided a cure for every disease. So there's nothing that we can endure in this life that Allah hasn't provided a cure for. And the cure is free. Mm -hmm. No matter what the disease is. The cure for it is free. Alhamdulillah. What, what, what's so beautiful about your story and this is why people are so attracted to it is because on one end you have people who are so fascinated with these two minute videos that get like you know hundreds of millions of views and people are like you know just drooling at the mouth you got the scantily dressed trodgy dressed women that are being used and abused really on these uh, by some of these uh, artists out there no shame of what's being said and you know the, the language that's used and this is the true oppression of the women I believe Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But then people are just so caught up with that. But then to see someone get out of that and to come out and to really, because even, even the Kanye Wests and many of those who are in that lifestyle, they talk about and they sing about the corruption in there, you know, uh, all the, all the evil that's in this world, but then they don't get out and do what you've done. 
you know, to submit to the truth, to come to the truth, you know what I mean? And still not go back. Yeah. And may Allah protect you, me, all of us I from mean. going back to those days of ignorance, you know? I mean. So that's what's beautiful, you know, and it's captivating. Yeah, I mean, someone who was up at the mainstream like that, and now he's a Muslim. And not just someone who's, who's because you do have Muslims, but then they're shy to come out. Like you, you're on the bre breakfast club not too long ago. And you're asked about music, and you're like, you're, you're breaking down why, Absolutely. you know, why you don't listen to music Absolutely. because the lifestyle that comes with it. Yeah. You're saying Subhanallah. Yeah, because the thing <laughs> you're is, you're saying this. Alhamdulillah is yeah. coming nat natural. You're not shy about that. Well, I mean, this is the problem. And you I, get what I'm saying? I absolutely. Where people understand. we know they're Muslim, but now they're very timid. They're very scared. You know, they're kind of undercover. Well, see, this is this is the overwhelming presence of opposition to Islam that resides in the West, preferably America, you know, the UK, England, so on and so forth, is that, and then you have media that plays a very significant role in placing a particular identity on the Muslims that's a false narrative. So what happens is, you know, the more a person's heart is inclined to pleasing the law, he'll do it at the expense of the people's anger. You understand? You'll do it at the expense of the people's anger. Meaning, I'd rather please Allah and have you angry at me. Opposed to pleasing you and having Allah anger at me. You know what I'm saying? Angry with me. So it becomes a, a, a situation of perspective. We say we love Allah and His Messenger. We testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad Wasallam is His Messenger. So with this testimony, right, with a Pure intention, statement of the tongue, which follows is action of the limbs. These three things have to be synonymous. We can't just have a pure intention and not speak. Or we can't just speak and not act. All of these things have to be synonymous. And that's a part of our ascription to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi know, And when it comes to courage, courage is not measured just by acts of violence or in implementing aggression when you know we feel that Islam is attacked or you know the, the religion is being slandered and so on and so forth you know when you come from a place of understanding it becomes a lot more easier to implement wisdom and the wisdom is a person that stands for something is more respected than a person who stands for nothing so we're men and this should be something that's incumbent upon men, not just the Muslim, but men in general. Whatever you stand for, stand on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's the way I was raised in the streets before Islam, is that whatever it is, I'm standing on I'm standing on that. So I love Allah and His messages. I love what Allah loves. I hate what Allah hates. And this becomes regulation of my emotions. Yeah. So when I love what Allah loves, alhamdulillah, my emotions are in the right place. If it's something that Allah forbids and He hates it, then I hate it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So... Why would you not defend what you love? Yeah, and, and this is what uh, Kunta Kinte and and the the roots of the African American people. Mm -hmm. Kunta Kinte in that that movie Roots, he's saying Allah, Allah. Yeah. So this is not some foreign god, some nah. god of the Arabs or not something. And the the um, the injustice that was done to the African Americans. I mean, you had the original the original people who came here. What was it like? 30, 40 percent were Muslim. Muslims. They were print. You know, they weren't savages living on. Another, they were uh, princes and and queens Absolutely. and people who were you know having a noble life. They were kidnapped. They were Muslim though, right? They were Muslim. So the African American roots. Anytime I speak to an African American, whether it be in an Uber or anywhere, I try to point them back to their yeah. roots. You know, See which is Islam. Exactly. See, the thing is, I just had this conversation before I left here. I was at the radio station. Yeah. And I was trying to explain to, you know, you know, my, my, my people, you know what I'm saying, as far as my ethnicity in this country, that the true unified front when it comes to establishing good comes from belief. We unite upon belief. This is the unity amongst the Muslims. And is the most and is the unity that should be established even amongst the Muslims. So it's not just an ethnicity thing that takes place in America. This is something that's widespread. And the only way we get back to a place of unity, for example, Allah says in the Quran, He says, He said, Verily the disbelievers are allies of one another. And if you do not do the same, there will be fitna in the earth and major corruption. 
So this is actually the state we live in. It. So Allah made it clear that those who disbelieve, they share commonality. The Muslims, if you do not do the same, the result of that will be fitna in the earth and major corruption. So this applies specifically to the believers and also the methodology of unification applies generally. So when you look at a people who are oppressed and disenfranchised in this country for over 500, 400, 500 years, getting back to the source is what's going to rectify the present and the future. So if the source and your origin coming to this country is coming from Islam, because even geograph geographically, if you looked at those countries where predominantly slaves were extracted, they were extracted from predominantly Muslim countries. Yes. So that means that everything that transpired, everything that was fed to a people that was incorrect or was fed to demoralize, demean, break down, cause discord and splitting, there would have never been anything that would have been allocated that would have been of good other than what was taken, which was Islam. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is something that I try to establish, but I do it in the means respectfully, and I try to use wisdom because, you know, Allah says, La there's no compulsion in the religion, so we can't compel people mm -hmm. or force people to accept Islam. Yeah. We can only articulate the truth, the benefits, and the virtues of Islam, and you accept it, you know what I'm saying? It's between you and the Lord. So we took it a little back in history, just give a condensed version of you coming out of that lifestyle, having it all, you know, finding peace and purpose in Islam, submission to the creator, not the creation, the way of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and just the last and final message Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them all. No, so this is not a new religion, it's, it's the same way of life that was from the first man, Adam, to all the messengers, and we're living here today. And then you're out there traveling, you're trying to get the youth off drugs. You're trying to share the message of peace and purpose with humanity. And then you get kidnapped in Brussels. Alhamdulillah. Tell us about that. Alhamdulillah. Is that right? You got kidnapped? Absolutely. I mean, but it's by law's decree. So you're doing good yeah. out there. And then, you know, something from the... Bring us up to speed. How? Why did you get kidnapped? Basically, there was a conspiracy that took place in 2008 with a group of individuals who I only knew one person. And this was prior to Islam. I wasn't a Muslim yet. So this was me at the very, you know, weaning stages of leaving the music business. My love for the underdog. I met a guy who was, you know, aspiring to be an artist. And I tried to show him a way through the means and resources that I had. So in my bad judgment, he inquired about something. That at the time, you know what I'm saying, I was knowledgeable of, but I wasn't involved in. So I actually did something that became detrimental later is I introduced him to somebody who they had a relationship and the, con and the conspiracy revolved around their relationship and their dealings. I was free from the matter. So now, fast forward, I become Muslim. And like I said, I fled with my religion. Everything I did was public. So it wasn't like I was a fugitive. I was running from anything. Every talk I gave, including your show, everything was transparent. Everything was visible and obtainable. Now, when I get to Belgium, I'm told by Interpol, I got grabbed by Interpol, I was told that I had an indictment in the Eastern District of North Carolina in a city called Durham, which I never visited. So now this is already a fishy situation. But fighting to make sure my extradition was not violated or my constitutional rights wasn't violated i came to you know stateside and i was sentenced to 14 years in prison mm -hmm. you know for a conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute a kilo of heroin and i never sold heroin a day in my life or law yaleen and the individuals who put me in a conspiracy i didn't have any real dealings with these guys you know so so you introduced introduced A to B, pretty much, and and I became C D E F all the way to Z. Uh huh. Yeah, simple. So that's interesting. When you when you look at, um, we know in Islam that a person can go towards an evil deed, mm -hmm. right, 
and then if they might have an intention, but even if they don't do the evil deed, they get the reward. They get the reward, yeah. right? Um, or uh, you know, they thought about doing something. They were about to do it. Again, they walked away, but here you didn't even do it. Yeah. Right. You you introduced two people. Absolutely. Whatever they did, and then how do you end up going? You to see, the one thing I've never done through the course of my whole incarceration is try to figure out the wisdom behind what Allah had decreed. Yeah. You know, and that's something that can definitely lead to removing yourself yeah from understanding what is clear as far as what the law established of accepting his divine decree the good of it and the bad of it so the tangible evidence is what people struggle with yeah but the ultimate defining factor is that this is from Allah's decree so i accepted it and for nine years i was able to increase in everything i was searching for prior to that because you know trying to study in egypt and at the same time taking invitations going to other places giving talks it was impeding my process i actually learned arabic more in prison i actually started to obtain more understanding of the language the quran you know the books of the ulama and so on and so forth in prison i ended you up, had access to all that yeah absolutely i had maybe at one time maybe over 92 books you know saying maybe 80 90 percent of them in arabic and some in english i met a lot of strong brothers you know a young palestinian brother named muhammad was the imam in one spot he was younger than me i benefited being around him another brother named isan who was from bangladesh younger than me benefited from him he was in half half in quran you know i've been in positions where i've been the imam and so on and so forth so it's like what I thought I had very little of became more of a benefit in prison. So then you start to understand the wisdom behind what Allah decreed. It wasn't so much about me being this baby who just accepted Islam. It was that whatever I was exposed to, taught and learned of Tawheed and implementation of the understanding of Tawheed, it became a benefit for many people in the prison system. Yeah. So ultimately this becomes the wisdom behind why things happen. So if I were in another course, then my hairline would probably be back here, stressed out, lost weight, just looking yeah. weak because that is the sign of someone who either rejects, because if you don't accept, you reject the decree of Allah. And alhamdulillah, Allah never placed in my heart anything that would have made me feel like what he decreed for me wasn't of my benefit. And then there's there's supposed to be relief in that. There's supposed to be some Absolutely. solace. The that, relief is now. I'm sitting that, here with my brother. That qadr, I mean, that qadr, this, but when you're in that situation yeah. and you go back on that, right? And this is supposed to help you get through that. Absolutely. Right? That's part of it. Right? Because acceptance, is it, it takes the, 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 the initial yeah. burden off your shoulder. Yeah. Now moving forward, you can be clear yeah. of what comes your way. You know, the hadith where the Prophet said, don't say oh, exactly. if... I did this or that or the other, you know, say it's the decree of Allah. That's right. Otherwise, That's you drive your, Allah yeah. Wa sure. yeah. Nah, so. yeah, otherwise you drive yourself crazy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, that's the beauty of us. We live in our hearts. You know, the, the true believer lives in his hearts because mm -hmm. this is the thing that Allah targets in the Quran, yeah. the hearts, mm -hmm. not the intellect. You know, we have akal, but there's a place for that. Yeah. But as far as our ultimate living space is our heart. Yeah. You have to live here. You have to reside here in order to feel, in order to understand, to comprehend. You know what I'm saying? And to act with sound purpose. It has to come from here. And then you were you were kind of entrapped. You were given some options, but those options were like, okay, it was like if I go down that right that route and try to fight for this justice, I lose. I can get life in prison. Get life in prison. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So now this is where the akal comes in. Now yeah. we have to use our intellect. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because what Allah says in the Quran, let takti lu fusikum. Do not kill yourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So that would have been me killing myself. You know what I'm saying? Even though, alhamdulillah, I'm innocent, but the same token, I have, you know, my family has rights. You know what I'm saying? There's people who Allah placed me in authority over. My wife, my children, you know what I'm saying? So on and so forth. People who looked at me as the provider which I provide from Allah's means, mm -hmm. right? So with all of these things in place, you have to make a sound decision. You have to weigh the benefit versus the harm, right? So the benefit is, okay, I take the sentence, there's daylight. But at the same token, I take the sentence, I make the most of the time. 
And alhamdulillah, Allah, you know, allowed me to return in nine years opposed to 14. Mm -hmm. You know, went from 14, I got the two point reduction, dropped me down to 11 years. In the feds, you do 87% or 85.5, however you want to work. So that would have been nine years anyway. Yeah. Then I get immediate release. I signed for a compassionate release. I got immediate release. Wallahi Azim, today is actually the day I was supposed to get released. Mm -hmm. With no relief, like with no yeah. compassionate release, no filing in court, anything. Today was my out date. I was supposed to come home today to get 11 months halfway house. Was there so something Trump was mentioned in all this? Was had he, nothing to do with nothing Trump. Nothing with Trump. Had everything to do with me utilizing whatever rights is given yeah. to me, whatever rights that wasn't relinquished during yeah. the course of my incarceration, utilizing those rights to file for certain motions. And Qadrullah, I was granted the compassionate release, and I was released immediately. MashaAllah. Right away. Alhamdulillah. Don't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And you're here with us now, alhamdulillah. Now. MashaAllah. Tell us, uh, Islam in the prisons. Mm -hmm. How was it there when you came in? Were there a lot of Muslims there in the prisons? Jami Atul Yusuf. It's the University of Yusuf, alayhi salam. So, <laughs> mashaAllah. Uh, so I've met <laughs> some of the most, you know, inspiring, influential, and strong Muslims because under these circumstances, all we have is Islam. All we have is our brotherhood. So when those things become the things that remain from everything else that Allah has removed, then you either find refuge and solace in that or you incorporate the prison culture and be lost. Mm -hmm. So I've been to four different institutions in the feds and every community I went to, I had some benefit. I learned from brothers, brothers learned from me, the brotherhood, like we did things together, we worked out together, we played ball together, we had a Muslim team for this, and, and we stayed together. We found mm. ways to always be a part of each other's struggle, each other's life, each other's benefit, each other's education, so on and so forth. And that's something that's actually lacking in the free world. Yeah. How was it described to us, paint a picture, okay, you walk in to the, um, the prison, is it like, okay, you go to the left and they have this gang, people, folks, whatever, and then you have to start going who you're gonna click with, neutral, and then over here you got the Muslims. How, paint us a picture, how does it actually you know, work? Well, the thing, the command for us to seek, right? Uh -huh. You seek the Muslims upon arrival. Yeah. So the first person that you may engage or the first person you catch eye contact that look like he might know something or you stand at me, let's start a conversation. Hey, Leo, you know where the Muslims at? Does he, are they allowed to wear the kufis? Absolutely. Yeah. We're allowed to wear the kufis. You know, we are allowed to wear a thobe. Or, you know, shower the kameez, inshallah, like in certain spots just for Yomu Jumu'ah, not throughout the day, but just in Jumu'ah. They got lockers inside the chapel that you can change in there and wear your thobe. You know what I'm saying? You could wear an imam or everything. Alhamdulillah. I mean, the Muslims have fought to preserve some of the right to implement Islam, right? So to know that we're in a place where we're not taking this stuff for granted, it becomes difficult to see brothers who have the opportunity and the access to this stuff neglecting it, mm -hmm. you know? And I, and I just pray that Allah makes us better, you know, increase us in that zeal and that strength that we have when we first knew we was upon the truth. You know, we have to return to that, inshallah. How's the dawah in the prisons? How How is it? Did you, have, did, did you have any experiences where you're able to share with some of the inmates there and people actually accepted Islam? Absolutely, you know what I'm saying? By Allah's permission, I never do any counting, you know what I'm saying? But it was always, you know, you got time. So when someone shows any type of inclination to Islam, you're more than open to teach them. What else I got to do? Like, where else I got to go? You know what I'm saying? And it actually strengthens your understanding for yourself at the same time you're teaching and inviting someone to something that's good. And, you know, by Allah's permission, I'll say this. I've never entered a single institution where someone hadn't accepted Islam. So, I mean, literally, I've never been to an institution where someone hasn't come to me seeking Islam and testified 
that none has the right to be worshipped with Allah and then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah in my presence. You know what I'm saying? And so on and so forth. I speak to a brother now, my good brother, his name is Umar Sheikh. You know what I'm saying? And Pakistani brother, mashallah, tabarakallah, he's a beautiful brother. I speak to him all the time. Since I've been home, he's called me, you know, several times, telling me about people that we are familiar with that we were working on. Mm. I said, guess who took Shahada? Guess who took Shahada? Guess who took Shahada? Like, it never stops. It's like, this guy took Shahada. SubhanAllah, the guy that we, wow, mashallah. Oh, guess what? Guess who took Shahada? So the brothers is in there calling the people to Islam, even during COVID. Like everyone's locked down, isolated from one another, and everybody's calling each other to Islam. We're calling the, you know, the non-Muslim to Islam, and we're calling the Muslims to return to Islam. You know what I'm saying? This da'wah doesn't just start or stop with the non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. That's what people have to understand. The call is to also remind the Muslims to return to Allah. Mm -hmm. And then we call the non-Muslims as well to accept you know, what conforms with your natural disposition. I want to take a minute and I want to share, because I'm sure this lady here used to listen to your songs and maybe still does. So she's very popular. I don't know if you've heard of this woman, uh, Candace Owens. Have you heard of her? Um, wow, wow. Yeah, and I want to get your reaction. She has a, a few things to say. And I want to see if we can get a message to her. But I want to start from the beginning here. I want to go back into little girl Candace, the first time that I ever heard about Islam, um, the first time that I ever heard about, you know, Muslims in the context of a political ideology or religion. And that was the first memory that I had was in third grade. And we were reading a book and they were saying uh, in this book that Muslim, being a Muslim is just like being a Christian. Islam is exactly like Christianity, is exactly like Judaism. And uh, we were told that the prophet Muhammad is exactly like Jesus Christ. I believe this as a child. I think that a lot of Americans that are watching this can relate to this sort of uh, the religion of peace. It's just like Christianity. Um, is any of that true? So you, you haven't, she's very involved in politics now. She's a person who is very outspoken, and some of these people end up speaking sometimes out of their lane. She didn't have not, here. She's talking to a person who's actually not an imam. He's like someone who's put out there, like a he's like a a fake imam. Right? <laughs> Help us. So, uh, what would you say, like, to someone like her who's probably listened to your uh, uh, music from the past for anything, but she's mentioning something so dear to you? Right. And she's probably got a lot of misconceptions in her mind. If you can talk to someone like that, what would you say to her? Well, I would clarify what has already reached the, of the connection between the books that Allah revealed, the messengers, you know what I'm saying, and prophets that Allah has sent in concession to different nations, and that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu being the seal of all of those prophets. And that their call and their religion was one. That's the commonality. But to say that they're the same, you know what I'm saying, would be taken away from, you know, a clear perspective and understanding of what Islam entails. Right? And I've ran into people like her, and you have to have a certain sense of concern. Because one, for a person to even embark on any understanding of religion means that they're, you know, partially there. You know, understand? As Muslims, all we're trying to do is get them all the way there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Without no deception. We're not trying to deceive nobody. We're only here to convey what is correct so that it doesn't become a proof against me. Yom Kiyama, when I have to stand before my Lord. So to... Candace and anyone who's inclined to Islam it is our obligation to clarify first what is the foundation is Tawheed so understanding Tawheed would definitely dispel any notion that is the same as Christianity as is practiced today versus the religion of Isa alayhi salam during the time of his messengership which was Islam which was monotheism same thing with Musa alayhi salam, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we stick to the usul. The people who ascribe themselves to the sunnah, 
we stick to the usul, meaning the foundation. So the foundation always starts with tawheed. No conversation should start unless it starts with tawheed. That pure monotheism. So the, the so the the connection between Jesus, Moses, Abraham, the last and final message of Prophet Muhammad is that pure mono the tawheed. Pure monotheism. Right. Tawheed. But now what people are practicing today of Christianity, worship, worshiping Jesus, you know, people uh, who say that Jesus is God, there's no evidence to back that up. There's no, there's nothing there that Jesus ever said, I'm God, worship me. But, but if the people look into tr the true message of Jesus and all the messengers, then that would, you know, uh, guide you to the right direction. Yeah, well, there's certain texts that's in the Bible that reside today that mm -hmm. many scholars in the past and in present have been able to point out where Tawheed still exists in, in the, the Bible, even with all its alterations, in the Bible, subtractions, yeah. you know, and so on and so forth, Tawheed still remains. So mostly when I talk to Christians who identify with these things and accept them, but then they find something that contradicts it and think that they're debating but you're only really debating with your own understanding because mm -hmm. you just affirmed that none has a right to be worshipped but God and God alone. Yeah. Right? It's in your first commandment. Thou shalt not place no other God before me. So we know that linguistically the word God means object of worship. So now the first commandment makes sense in the Bible. Thou shalt not place no other God before me, which is synonymous with la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. So now you affirm that but then, out of the sake of debating and arguing, you want to find another verse in the same book that contradicts that one. So the debate becomes with yourself. Yeah. You understand? And as Muslims, we have to use hikmah in these matters and just, you know, allow that to pass and then remain firm upon what they affirm. You yeah. affirm that there's only one God. There's only one creator. There's only one facilitator, arranger, sustainer, organizer of all the affairs of creation. We agree. So if this unique ability is only deserving of one, then it shouldn't it be his right and his right alone to be worshipped? That's simplicity. Mm -hmm. People don't like simplicity for some reason. Like like complications, confusing, you know what I'm saying, chaos. But I chose Islam for simplicity. Because all of the distortions and everything that I used to think became simplified with the Kelly Matain. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah and what followed continuously and consistently was attached to that statement. Yeah. That's consistency, that's simplicity, and is lasting and it never gets old. Yeah. So someone like her or anybody else now in the African American community, we talked about one what's beautiful about your life is now if you're seeking purpose, purpose is not in like you said, I can go get the gold chain, I can get the car, the massage, and then something comes up and happens and ruins my whole day and then another stress. You know, yeah, I make another that's what society tells yeah. you. You know what I'm saying? That's not what Allah tells you. Yeah. Society tells you that success is based upon things you accumulate. Mm -hmm. Allah says success is upon belief. Yes. Dying upon belief. Living upon belief. That none has a right to be worshipped but Allah. The Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the message of Allah. Yeah. Living upon that. Implementing that in your life. And dying upon that. Mm -hmm. That's success. Still simple. Still easy. You're breaking down simple. So you have that. And then you have the roots there. And then you have that connection with the pure monotheism. Do you think... what Have you heard these names like DJ Khaled... Uh, what else? Somebody, I know Khalid very well. I you know Khalid. I just haven't spoken to him since I've been you home. You know him very, very well. Uh, who else? Some. Uh, what's What's the name? Um, French Montana. I met French yeah. them a couple weeks ago. A couple we weeks talked, ago. We talked. Alhamdulillah, yeah. may Allah continue to increase him because he's definitely trying to implement what is correct. So for me, like I said, with all of these people that you named and we probably going to name, you know, first and foremost, we always ask a lot to guide them. I mean, I mean, we always I mean, ask absolutely. a lot to guide us. Purify our I mean, intentions I mean, too. Yeah. So our intentions is pure going into these things. We're not trying to keep score. We're not trying to keep record. We're not here to say that I'm the Shahada king and all mm. this type of stuff, stuff for the law of Deen, but we do this solely for the sake of Allah and we want good for the people. You know what I'm saying? Because we're supposed to be the best of the people for the people. So that's a responsibility. You know what I'm saying? That if we're going to be the best of the people for the people, mean it by example, you know what I'm saying? By methodology, by implementation of that understanding and so on and so forth, inviting to it, then this obligation doesn't rest until we see the result of Allah. Yeah. Are you able to sit and talk? You know, many people, everybody knows Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. right? 
and not only a legend in the ring but mainly what he did outside the ring mm -hmm. but you know my teacher knew him very well one of my former teachers who used to run a, a, a dawah center was was muhammad ali his his love for this dean for sharing he used to give out pamphlets and he, who was jesus and what is islam and he used to actually sign his name and that's how give he would give the autographs people in this uh industry are you able to sit with them and do you think how much of an impact would they have if because we get excited you'll see you see not too long ago we see we saw um uh, Mike Tyson, where he was praying in public. Yeah, with Badu Jack. Yeah, and just by praying, that prayer, people were getting so excited. Imagine, you know, how much impact someone like Mike Tyson or some of these, if they really started to, you know, um, change their life for the better and start to really implement yeah. the Tawheed, implement Islam. Well, the thing is, even whatever it is they do yeah. that inspires, they've done a great justice for Islam. See, the thing is, like the Prophet Sallallahu said, Talib al-Ilm, Faridatu ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is, is comment, obligatory yeah. upon every Muslim. So when we see the things that inspire us to want to learn more, we have to take those inspirations, right? Attach them to our heart. And then we have to strive to increase in that which is good. Because what happens is for the ones who do choose to implement seeking knowledge, we want to put the burden solely on their shoulders. You know, go ask the imam. Yeah, Don't yeah, ask yeah. me. Ask the imam. You know what? Go on YouTube. Pull up such and such and such. This becomes a, a lackadaisical effort of establishing what you may already know. You know, you can't demote your value because you only know just the quotes. You know what I'm saying? You only know the, the last three stories in the Quran. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, you know something. You know what I'm saying? And you have to teach that. Even if you only know Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You have to teach that. And every Muslim needs to understand this obligation and not assume that the burden is just those who seek knowledge. It's yours as well. So when you're frequenting amongst, you know what I'm saying, Muslims or even the non-Muslims, every time an opportunity presents itself, you're supposed to seize that opportunity to teach. Because when you do that, it becomes a defining factor of what your presence is going to be around those people. Islam will choose your friends for you. Because if every time I speak about Islam, I stop playing ball or go pray and I do all these things, you know what happens? You're either going to continue picking me to play basketball because you respect the fact that I stopped to do these things, or you're going to distance yourself from me. So I didn't have to make the choice. Islam made the choice for me. You understand? Oh, I got to go. I got to get out of here. I got to pray. Oh man, I, you always gotta pray. I used to go through this in prison sometimes. Yeah, oh, yeah. come on, I, we gonna stop picking you, man, because you always got. But well, listen, <laughs> while you're playing ball, you yeah, had, you had, I stop. There you go. That's a big, so great, great is, example. Exactly. So the point of the matter is, this obligation is not just mine. It's not just yours. It's everybody's. It's every Muslim's obligation to teach what you know, because if you know Islam is the truth, it doesn't matter about your shortcomings. Doesn't matter about your deficiencies or your flaws. The obligation still remains. If you know Aleph Bat Tat, teach it. You know Bismillah Rahman Rahim, you teach it. All you know is Al Fatiha, you teach it. If all you know is the Tasha Hu, whatever it is, your obligation to teach it remains until you reach until you meet your Lord. So we have to stop abandoning the obligation. And this is for everybody. This is this is for the names we mentioned, we didn't mention for for everybody. This is just Kulu our movement. Yes. Every believer. Yes. Allah Musta'an, Yaqi. Right. We know this is this is this is what we here for. Yeah. Well, let's uh we'll end with that. It's beautiful to see you, man. Beautiful to see you too as well. May Allah bless you. Where can people if they want to get in touch, you know, look up at you got some documentary coming out Yes, heard? I'm working on a documentary so I can actually put to the side all of the questions about yeah. all of the transitions. I feel like if I share that one time, I can place those things behind me. And that if I'm invited to speak, you know, the questions would be relevant to what you've already sown or what you've learned about me. I have a book also I'm trying to, you know, release. And I'm just pretty much in the same place I left. You know, mm -hmm. I love Islam. I love the Muslims. And anything that I can do to contribute to the success of the believers, inshallah, in this life, I'm going to do what I can. You're going to be in... Uh Visiting Boda Jackson? Inshallah. I spoke to him. I want to go out there and visit him while they're in the training camp because 
I don't think the fight's going to have an audience. And I want to meet Mike again, too. I ain't seen Mike in years. You Inshallah, know? you can lead them in prayer again this time. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. And uh, we can get you on the... He, he can get you on the... Well, Mike is the elder, so he he's the elder. Right? a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and don't forget, if you see Mike, tell him to tune into the Dean Show. No, Inshallah. 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 Beautiful, brother. Jazakallah. Walaikum salam. And that was our brother, formerly known as Loon from Bad Boy Records. That's in the past got a new page in life where he left that old life that didn't bring him peace solace and happiness and he had all the finer things in life there's nothing wrong with enjoying some of the finer things in life but if it's built on that like he was saying that tohid that pure monotheism and that leads you to your purpose and via b candace owens via b dj Khaled, mike tyson via b whoever's up p diddy sean john whoever the case i mean to get to that it starts with something very basic and simple. It's actually on my shirt. Guide me, guide me, guide me. If you had a bus stop and you wanted to get from point A to point B, you didn't have a map, you'd ask someone for guidance. How do I get here? How do I get there? But what about, what's my objective in this life? Why am I here in this world? What am I living for? Is it just the dollars? Is it just for fame? Is it just for popularity? I'm going to be held accountable when I leave this life. He realized that. Our brother realized that. And he looked behind the hype and he found everything based on evidence and proof in Islam. He's living it. Islam, that complete submission and surrender to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Just like Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and all the other messengers. They submitted not to themselves, not to the dollar, not to fame, not to popularity. But they called humanity and they did it themselves. They submitted to the one God, the one creator. And every we say Allah and the last and final messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He brought the evidence and everything you need to know that he was a messenger and that Islam is the truth. And it's all found in the Quran. Read the Quran and do the homework. Do the homework because this life is short. I love talking to people like this who've experienced all that. They've climbed up the ladder and every step they took up higher and higher, it didn't really find. They didn't really find what you think you're going to find when you get up there. They were already up there. You don't find that peace and silence submitting to the creation, submitting to your desires. You find it submitting to your creator because truly in the remembrance of God, Almighty Allah, do the hearts find rest. So we end with that. Guide me, guide me, guide me. That's the homework. Do what he did. Do what we're supposed to be doing. Asking the creator of the heavens and the earth alone, God Almighty Allah, for guidance. And he will, if you're earnestly seeking, facilitate a way. Thank you for tuning in to the Dean Show. Hope you enjoyed this interview. And again, subscribe if you haven't already and support us on our Patreon. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. And if you like this episode of the Dean Show, like this video, share this video far and wide and support us on our Patreon page so we can continue this work. Thank you for tuning in. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.